My name is Frederick. I work with uh, Day Rocket and soon to be in the future, Hotspot. And uh, I'm going to talk about the method handle. And how many of you here can say that you really understand the method handle? By heart. <laughs> okay, three people, that's good. <laughs> so the method handle is an opaque reference to a method. Uh, it embeds a type to verify that a call is safe at runtime. And it can box and unbox arguments at runtime, contrary to the standard outboxing that we have that can only box at Java C compile time. It can also be acquired using the load constant in the bytecode, so it integrates well with the bytecode. And you can bind the first argument. And this is relevant when that is a receiver, which means that you bind the environment in which the method is going to be executing. No, it, well, it should not. This implementation does not do that. And there is a good reason for that. So this is an example of a compilable programming. And as you can see, I've stored a method handle into a static field, so I cannot guess where. I cannot guess where we're going. Uh, still, at we have three different call sites to the same target. Each call site has a different signature. And as you can see here, the first signature is generated from the source code. This is uh, the trick that jo John Rose mentioned before. But we don't know where we're going, so we can only pick up the signature from the call site as it looks in the code. So it will be a primitive integer, the first argument. The second argument will be an object. And it will return a string. In the second case, we invoke on the same method handle, but in the second case, the arguments will be deduced to be the primitive int, a string, and return an object. And in the third case, we'll use the same method handle again, and we will send in a boxed object, and here it's clear that Java C that boxes, uh, and a primitive, and we will return an object. So, what is it going to print? It's going to print 1 equals 65, because 65 is a hash code of the string A. 2 equals 66, because 66 is a hash code of string B. And 3 equals 3, because 3 is a hash code of 3 when it's boxed. So you can see that it automatically took all the incoming arguments and made the necessary changes at runtime to adapt it to the target method that took a primitive and an object. And at first, this might look very uh, heavy and expensive. But it turns out there are many different ways you can optimize this code. For example, if all arguments match exactly at the call site compared to the target, then you can do a single compare to see if this is the correct target. If you have co contravariant references and all the rest of the primitives are exactly the same, you can do a quick lookup of co contravariants and use that to calculate that, yes, it's safe to jump to this method. And if we actually have to box, as we did in the last example, we can inline the boxing code and make it reasonably efficient anyway. Uh, the, actually, the specification of the invoked generic method handle doesn't say anything about co contravariance It says that you have to pass an object into a function. It will be typecast and potentially unboxed. And this will happen also for the return value. So this will lead to co contravariance because anything else will throw a class cast exception. So it's sort of implicit in the design. But we can use our knowledge about how to optimize co contravariance to optimize the call path for a method handle. So before we can start to discuss how fast the method handle invoke is, we have to understand how fast the ordinary invokes are. 
So we have the invoke virtual. Everybody knows how that works. We grab a virtual table from the Java object, and we offset into that virtual table depending on which method we want to invoke. And we grab that target and we call it. So it takes two loads. Now, how fast is an invoke interface? Well, that depends on the implementation. So JRocket uses a constant time lookup, and Hotspot, I believe, uses an iteration over the interfaces that are implemented by the class. So it can be done in two different ways. And we can't use the invoke virtual implementation for invoke interfaces because that would use an, an excessive amount of memory because the, the virtual tables would be too big. So we need some way to memory speed trade-off. And then the way we do it with invoke interfaces is based on a paper that I have a reference to somewhere, is that we compress the interface tables. So we specify buckets, and the definition of a bucket is that within this bucket are only interfaces that are never implemented at the same time by a class. So if you look up for an interface, my bucket uh, for this interface is seven, and you know that you have 10 different interfaces in that bucket, but you can only implement one of these interfaces, so it, you need only one check to look into that bucket. Of course, you have to look up the bucket first. Now, this is a graph coloring problem, but you can approximate it relatively fast. And it can be partially updated, and you only lose compression. So you can load a lot of classes and then recompress at later time when you need it. So you don't have to recalculate the, the graph every time you load a new class. So this is a machine code for interface of, uh, instance of check of an interface. So we load the virtual table and other metadata. We load the bucket number for this interface, which we know because we know which interface we're checking for. We load the buckets from the class that we're looking at, and we load the bucket content. And we look into that bucket. Is my interface in that bucket? Yes, then I'm compatible. Otherwise, it's some other interface or no interface at all in that bucket, and then I, it, I can't be compatible with that interface. So we need four loads for an instant of check. To actually dispatch, we need one or two more loads, depending on if you're running on a 32-bit architecture or a 64-bit. That is to acquire the virtual table and to index off into the virtual table that's relevant for this interface. <coughs> now, we can use the same technique to compress co-contra variance lookup tables for the method handle. So instead of storing interfaces that are, that are guaranteed to never be implemented in the same object, we can store function types that are guaranteed to be incompatible with, the, with each other in one bucket. So we have the call site types on top. We can see the call site socket object can safely call a target that takes SSL socket and returns string, because that will support the interface at the call site. And you can see the string that returns int can safely call a target that can te al allows objects as inputs. Now, at this level, you can see that any function that takes a primitive will not be treated with boxing or anything, because this is only part of the optimization steps. So we have a lot of incompatible method types, because every single, uh, every variadic variance will be its unique uh, set of method types. Primitives will generate new method types. So there will be a lot of overlap, which means that there is a, probably a lot of good compression in this. So now we have the tools to start invoking on the method handle in the use case where we don't know where we're going. So we have the first check. We load the method type from the method handle object. And at the same time, we load the target. And then we compare the method type with the, the hard-coded method type for this call site. Is it equal? Yes. Then we are done. But being equal is not particularly 
um, obvious. This, will, this check will not allow you to call with a string to a function that takes an object, which is pretty obvious that you want to do. You want to send a string into object, as an object. But it's useful when you have tracked the types, so you can create a call site that happens to be exactly the same as the target. Now, if that fails, we move down and we load the bucket number for this method type. And then we load the method, uh, buckets from the method type, and then we load the bucket content and we check if this call site is compatible with this target. If that's okay, yes, then we can also jump directly to the target. And now, if that fails, then we have to go to the slow case of boxing and unboxing. Before we jump to the target, though, we have to do a small check on the target variable to check if some bits indicates that we need to bind, sort of recreate the receiver, or if we need to do a virtual lookup. But I will not go into details here. But we can see that the method handle invoke can be as fast as two loads if you have a static method invoke that takes an exact match to the target. It needs three loads if you have a bound receiver because you need to load that as well. It needs four loads if you have a virtual target and you have exact match. And it needs five loads if you have a static target but you have a co-contra variant match. And you need six loads if you have a static target, variant bound, and you need seven loads for virtual target variant bounds. Now, two, three, four, five, six are as fast as invoke interface. So you have a new tool that offers you new flexibility that runs very often as fast as invoke interface or faster. Now what happens if in the generic case, when we cannot say anything, we have to box, okay? So you can generate a call site and you can generate code at a target and you can inline the boxing and you can amortize the allocation cost for all the boxed up objects on the same allocation. So I will, we can discuss this formula on the workshop, but it's, a, it's not an enormous amount of extra loads to handle the boxing target. Of course it's costly because you will allocate memory, but it's not 10 times the cost, it's twice the cost. And yeah, sometimes it can be faster to box than to cost, which is a little bit surprising. Unfortunately, these are all premature optimizations. So, in any reasonable code, we are going to inline. And that's where this ability to box and unbox really shines. Because in the compiler, you will have a chain of boxing, unboxing, boxing, unboxing, and boxing, unbox. And it's actually quite easy to get rid of that chain. So, this is the original example, slightly simplified. And you can see it, instead of storing the method handle into a static field, we just load it up using the load constant. And we do the three invokes. And we return the sum of the return values. And the calculation is adding the first value to the hash code of the second value. If this works. No, it did not. Okay, I'll have to do that with this. <coughs> this is the first step in the compilation of this code. So you can see the first op is to move the load constant, and it's here. This is after JRocket has pre-processed the bytecode. So this is the internal representation of this code. You load the constant of the method handle into the abstract variable v1. You do a method handle invoke, which is represented here uh, using its own opcode, and it takes the argument v1, and it sends in the constant 1, as you remember and the constant string a. And it returns the value v3. And v3 is then added to the v5. And this in turn is added to 
V10, which comes from the third invoke, and this is returned. So what happens now is that it starts inlining, and this is the first unboxing that's inlined. Now it's going into static is single static assignment form. Now it's propagating the constants into the method handle invoke. Can you read? No. Okay. Can you read now? <coughs> hmm? So you can see it's now propagating the constant uh, target into the method handle operations. And as in this step, we can see that it deleted the first operand operation because it's no longer necessary. <coughs> and more copy propagation. And now it did an optimization where it could see that, okay, we're doing an inline on a method handle target that's constant. Obviously, we can replace this with a normal call. Bigger, please. Obviously, we can replace this. Bigger. Ah, bigger, sorry. <laughs> I'm a little bit tired today. So, obviously, we can replace it with a normal call. And that's what's happening here. So, this was the old code, method handle invoke, test to calc. And now we have an actual call to test calc instead. And after that, it will proceed in a normal way to optimize the code. It will inline calc. Calc performs a hash code. It will inline it again and inline it again. It will inline integer value. And now we have the sequence of boxings, calls, and check types, and unboxings. And a lot of this is unnecessary. So we're going to see that it detects the dead things. It detects that this write, this boxing here was unnecessary. So it will ignore the boxing, and it will go sooner go, uh, disappear. So we, we boxed three here. It's specific, it's specific for integer long float double char. Uh, so it's only the, uh, the intrinsics that we have. Uh, and there is no inherent difficulty in allowing other things to be boxed. And this optimization is actually standard optimization because it works on any field. It just happens to be that it's useful to uh, use the box opcode uh, to represent this makes it easier to read and sometimes easier to analyze the code. But the same optimization is used all over the place to uh, erase unnecessary loads and stores to fields that are repeated. So that's, that's what's happening here. And now it's inlining the hash code for string. And here it has detected that uh, I could, it could propagate the constants into the code. So a lot of choices here has been erased and branches killed. So to compare is no longer here. We can see that it's going to move the calculated value 65 into the destination register. And now it's going to be starting to be very short. And what happened here? It actually calculated the final value because everything was constant. <laughs> so you can guess what's going to happen next. <laughs> yes, <laughs> all the codes just. And then finally, you got the machine code. So it's actually transformed the whole method handle expression into a single constant. And this is the power of the method handle because it integrates with the compiler. Uh, 